Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe Trainer, and welcome to our 12th installment of Please Join Me. Uh, today I have a, a wonderful guest whom I've known for, it's like I know everybody for 30 years. I, I haven't met anybody lately, uh, but Philip Brown, Philip R. Brown as he's now known, Phil Brown to me, and uh, we went to college together. I've always looked up to Phil, he's about 6'3", I think, right? Isn't that right, Phil, you're about 6'3"? Six, 6'3 three? Six, three and a half. Yeah, I figured as much. Well, don't worry, you'll shrink over time. <laughs> We all do. Uh, and um, Phil has had a very interesting career. He was a very prominent attorney in Hawaii for many years, uh, now living in Colorado. And um, he has written a book, which we're going to talk about. Um, and uh, it's been well received. I'm going to say a little bit about the book. Uh, it's called It Gives You Strength. And uh, basically the premise is that an alien visitor to the primitive planet Earth, and boy, is it getting more primitive by the day, has one mission to bring a child home. However, while searching for her, the alien is caught in a gang war. He must act quickly or his home planet will devastating, or his home planet will, sorry, comma, devastating the Earth. I get it now. I have some quotes here, folks, uh, that uh, really lay some praise on, on Phil's book. Uh, here's one. Brown's prose undoubtedly captures the reader on the page. He makes the 1920s in upstate New York feel as exciting as an old-time thriller, with gun-wielding big shots, intense rivalries, and the perfect wild card character. That's from the Independent Book Review. And here's one more. It's been a while since I enjoyed a book this much. It's a well-written sci-fi fantasy with perfect pacing. That's the Emerald Book Reviews. And I'm thrilled to have Phil here with me, and I'm delighted to know that his book is getting such wonderful attention. Phil, welcome. How are you doing today? Hi, Joe. I, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, so now I'm going to ask you, of course, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're from, and uh, you know, give us the uh, abridged, abridged version, whatever you want to tell us, uh, which led you basically to becoming an author. All right. Well, I was born in a little town called Granville, New York. And in fact, the uh, novel, It Gives You Strength, is set in Granville, New York. Um, I, uh, as you know, Joe, because we met at Lemoyne College in Syracuse, New York, a very fine liberal arts college. Uh, I studied history and political science there. I uh, graduated with my law degree from Washington and Lee University in 1985. I practiced law in Manhattan um, uh, and then uh, moved uh, to Hawaii where I spent the bulk of my legal career, had a wonderful legal career in Hawaii um, and uh, uh, started having a large family as I entered my 50s. And uh, my wife and I um, decided that um, I, it would be far more likely for um, uh, our children to see their grandchildren or to see their grandparents who live uh, in California and in Colorado if we moved to the mainland. And we've done that. We live now in Colorado. My wife is a internist, a hospital doctor, actually fighting the battle against COVID daily. And I take care of our kids and uh, write now. And I've written my first novel, It Gives You Strength. I'm working on my second one. Now, when did you decide, or maybe you've always harbored this particular germ, or this uh, had the idea of becoming a writer? Well, when you are a lawyer, you, the romantic part of being a lawyer, of course, is you know trials, arguing in front of a jury, and I definitely was an accomplished trial lawyer. But even when you do a big trial, you spend most of your time writing briefs. And uh, I was always complimented on my writing ability um, by judges and lawyers. And, and uh, so I always knew that someday I was going to try to write uh, creatively. Um, so that when my wife and I uh, decided to move to Colorado, um, uh, she's, uh, and uh, now we were close to her, my in-laws, um, and she said, what would you like to do? What's a bucket list item you would like to do? And I said, I would like to write. And she said, then just do it. And uh, that's what I've been doing. How did you arrive 
on the topic of what you've written about and also the genre of science fiction. There's, I'm sure that the, you have an interest in that category and, and you may have grown up watching uh, a lot of the shows and reading uh, a lot of the books that were popular, you know, of our generation. Of course. And um, it, w interesting. Um, of course I did. Yes. And we all know the, the great um, writers of our um, generation uh, in science fiction. Um, but I started writing this book because I wanted to write about prohibition and wow. my, and my grandfather um, is, was a bootlegger in upstate New York and a very prominent bootlegger. And I started writing this novel as though I was going to uh, chronicle my family for my children who've never met their great grandfather, don't know anything about him. Um, then as I got into it, I realized that I <clears throat> didn't have enough information um, and um, I could make it far more interesting and wild if I added a third party who was observing. And that's how the alien uh, character came here. And I, I don't know if you remember the old, the, not so old, but 70s movies, or it might be 80s, Starman with Jeff Bridges. And they used Jeff Bridges' alien character as a vehicle to address the uh, absurdity of our inviting aliens to Earth. And when they get here, basically NASA or uh, Yeti was going to uh, to trap them and some people wanted to even dissect them and uh, we invited them here right so I thought I want as I look at prohibition and I look at the many other government programs that were developed during the 1920s many of which were well-intentioned the best way I the best literary device I could think of to point out the absurdity of these programs is to bring in a third party and so I, I brought in the um, Tashin Zhou character, who is the alien from an advanced race coming here to save a child. Um, and uh, he gets caught in the middle of a gang war between the, the good bootlegger and the bad bootlegger. Yeah, well, I know a little bit about this. Um, and you say upstate New York, and I know there's the character Legs Diamond, in your book. Uh, I worked on a musical many years ago, uh, it was a huge flop, uh, called, uh, called Legs Diamond, uh, but I became a little familiar with that character then. And then also, uh, I would imagine you're familiar with the work of William Kennedy. Sure, I read, I read that book in, in researching. He yeah. actually did three, but yes, uh, 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 the Albany area, but I only read yep. one, but I saw yeah. the movie I <laughs> Yeah, I, um, I've read all his, I've read most of his stuff, Iron Weed and Billy Phelan's Greatest Game. Uh, and you know who knows him uh, is Professor Keen of Lemoyne College. Wow, I didn't know Friendly that. with him. Yeah, so um, perhaps uh, we can uh, broker at least a conversation. You might like to speak with him. I'd, I'd certainly like to meet him and speak with him. So we'll, he, he, we'll talk about that. Sure. Um, yeah, Legs Diamond. Um, I'm, I'm very um, proud of the fact that I, I wrote um, some interesting fictional characters and I did research of uh, actual historical characters like Legs Diamond, Jack right. Dempsey, yep. uh, Edith Cavell, the great um, English war hero. Um, and I built a story where these historical figures interact with fictional characters that I created out of thin, thin cloth, whole cloth, excuse me. And uh, um, Legs Diamond is a great, great character um, to write about, which is why people must make musicals about him, why I selected him as the uh, antagonist in my book. Um, although um, I am told in my family lore that uh, my grandfather, did business with Legs Diamond, um, although um, I'm told that my 
grandfather's business relationship with Legs Diamond was much better than my character, Mike Kelly's business relationship with Legs Diamond in my book. Now, tell us a little bit about what you learned about Legs Diamond. And some people know about Legs Diamond. They might know kind of the outside story. What did you find out maybe by digging deeper that people might not know? Well, um, the musical that you talked about um, and some of the um, uh, books, movies that have been made about Legs Diamond um, romanticize not just Legs Diamond, but all of the uh, criminals during the 1920s because you know, now it's very common. People drink, people wanted alcohol in the 1920s. Some of the uh, gangsters in the 1920s seemed almost heroic. But Legs Diamond was not heroic at all. Um, in fact, um, my book takes place in 1926, but there was one particularly horrific incident where Legs Diamond owned a nightclub, I believe it was on Broadway, and um, he uh, was uh, reputed to have murdered a fellow mobster in front of a crowd of just tourists and you know, partiers. And um, a number of them were going to be witnesses against him. And um, he slaughtered tens of people. Uh, and we don't think, at least I don't, when I romanticize um, gangsterism in the 1920s, I think of, well, you know, if these mobsters wanted to kill each other over their turf, you know, they all got into it. Uh, knowing what they were doing, they didn't kill civilians. Well, Legs Diamond did. And uh, he, was a, he was a brutal, brutal murderer. And I don't think I realized that getting into the research, and certainly that Broadway play you're talking about, um, didn't uh, depict him that way. Um, that, that's, I think I... Um, depict him that way in the novel. So you write your novel. It takes how long, Phil, more or less from start to finish? It took me two years. I think I could have done it more quickly. Um, it took me two years because it was the first one I've ever written. Um, Did you uh, find yourself going on site to do research? Did you go to different places? So much of it's available online now. Um, I've, I did research online. I did research in the uh, libraries here in Colorado. Uh -huh. uh, I spent a lot of time in the library uh, here in Colorado. They're very nice. And I, um, yes, I went back to Granville. Um, uh, so much of the um, book takes place in Granville, New York, Whitehall, New York, Saratoga, New York, and Albany, mm -hmm. Albany, New York, which is where Legs Diamond um, uh, spent so much time. Um, I, I did not go. He actually was put on trial in Troy, New York, which is only about 12 miles from Albany. I did right. not go there. I'm familiar with that area just because I grew up there. But um, uh, he was, he eventually died I believe it was in 1931, December 16th. And uh, he was put on trial for the kidnapping and torture of a man named Grover Parks. And they, they um, tried legs and a jury in Troy, New York, found him not guilty of kidnapping and torture. And that night he went out and got drunk and he went home to a little uh, apartment that he rented. And uh, then that uh, morning at about 4.30, someone, and they never solved the crime, uh, put two bullets in his back and uh, one bullet in his head. And that was the end of Legs Diamond. Um, and the crime was never solved. And uh, William Kennedy discusses this at great length in the novel, or not novel, his is a, uh, I guess it is historical fiction. Um, but um, Kennedy has all sorts of uh, theories. Um, it could be uh, that it was the Albany police themselves um, who did the deed. 
Um, it could be it was relatives of all of those civilians who were murdered um, following uh, uh, the uh, uh, nightclub incident I, I mentioned earlier in New York. Um, it could be rival mobsters. And in fact, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going on, but you did ask me about Lake Diamond. Please do. No, no, go ahead. Yeah. The reason he moved to upstate New York, I mean, he was a prominent mobster in New York City. He wasn't as prominent as he perceived himself, but he was prominent. And uh, um, he, at least as Kennedy and other historians describe it, uh, he had double, by the time he fled New York City for upstate New York, he had double crossed every major mobster in New York. York City, and they had the the um, uh, organized crime had given permission for uh, the syndicate to shoot Legs Diamond, and they'd been trying to kill him, and that's how there, there was an expression: um, uh, "The bullet hasn't been made that can kill Legs Diamond." <laughs> and um, and you've probably, you laugh, you've probably heard it. It was, you know, he, he used to say that the bullet hasn't been made that it can. And I actually have a scene in the book where he, he says that to Mike Kelly, the bullet hasn't been made that can kill Legs Diamond. And uh, the alien looks at him and says, I, I agree. 1931. The bullet that will kill you has been made in 1931. It will, will be made in 1931. And Legs Diamond is like, what? The, what? What are you talking about? And then they go off on a uh, angry scene where the alien explains what's going to happen to him. And I, I, you know, some literary license there. Now, um, I wanted to ask, uh, tell us about the other major character that you mentioned earlier, Tashan Zo, and how that character figures into your plot. All right. Um, I needed... Uh, as I wrote the book and I realized that I wasn't going to be able to do it um, justice unless I created a third party, almost storyteller who um, someone who the, the story could be, whose eyes the story could be seen through. I um, um, decided to create a, alien character trapped on earth who was searching for a, another alien who had been lost eight years before. And I created uh, Tashin Zhou, an alien anthropologist from a far advanced, highly technical um, society who was sent to earth in search of a little girl. Um, the reason I did that was a very important part of the book that has nothing to do with prohibition, but was important to me emotionally, was in researching the book, I discovered something called the Craig Colony. I had never heard of it before. And when I tell you about it, Joe, you're going to be shocked that you've never heard of it. From 1896 until 1968, New York State had a massively funded program where if someone had epilepsy or had seizure disorders, they would be sent to a camp outside of Rochester in Sanye, New York, called the Craig Colony. And they would be isolated there just because they had seizures. And now people um, with epilepsy, they take medication and their seizures, um, uh, for the most part, are controlled. So. But from 1896 to 1968, epileptics in New York State were shipped to the Craig Colony. And while you were in the Craig Colony, um, the men were held on one side of the colony, the women were held on the other side of the colony. You weren't allowed to have sex. You weren't allowed to fall in love. You weren't allowed to marry. And, and the New York, I actually have this document the doctors at the Craig Colony in the early 1920s actually lobbied New York State to have um, the state of New York pass a law saying 
that people with epilepsy should be prohibited from falling in love and mar marrying other epileptics. Now, when I found that, I almost stopped writing this book and started to write about, because two questions I had. One, I was a history major at a college near Rochester. I've never even heard of this. Two, why hasn't anyone else heard of this? And I found out that not only did this colony exist in New York, there was one in Ohio, there was one in Virginia, there was one in Texas. And in 1926, the United States Supreme Court actually approved the sterilization of a woman simply because she had epilepsy. So I thought, well, I can write this dry history paper about this subject, or I can write a really interesting novel that every time someone reads the book or hears about the Craig Colony, they're going to Google the Craig Colony and they're going to see that I'm not even exaggerating. And that will shine a bigger light on this historical mystery than me writing, you know, a, a serious historical paper. And um, so, not to ruin the book, but um, that's why the aliens came in. The book starts with the aliens seeing the Craig colony from afar, realizing their little girl that, that, that has been separated from the aliens is at the Craig colony. And from outer space, they think it's a prison camp. And they think that this very important little girl is being held in a prison on earth and so they unleash this giant armada that's going to come to earth to rescue this little girl from this prison in upstate new york and in fact it's not a prison it's 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 a colony designed to be a safe haven for those people with epilepsy and in fact if you went into that safe haven you were held there for an indeterminate period, they later told you that you really don't start to improve in your seizures for at least two years. They taught you things like brick making. You know, eventually they, they were making a million bricks a year at the Craig Colony. They were very proud of that. Um, and um, why? Oh, oh, and if you go on right now, right now there's a website where there's family members searching for the bodies, the remains of their family members who were sent to the Craig colony and they never found out what happened to them. And you're thinking, you are, Joe, I know your heart, you have a wonderful heart. You're thinking, how could that have happened in New York State? I'm, I, I was shocked by it. And I, 1968 is when they finally closed it. I was eight years old by that. I mean, I'm astounded that there haven't been major motion pictures made about this place so anyways well, well now listen first of all I, I think it's great that you're calling attention to it and you're able to work it into uh your novel which is essentially an historical fiction a science fiction novel but it's it's just obviously a serious stain uh on the state and on an indictment of the, in the way, the medical profession at that time, certainly those who participated. And also, um, I wanted to say um, that, you know, now that you're calling attention to it, hopefully there'll be more public awareness. I'm sure your book is going to be widely read, at least that's our fervent hope, and that, you know, there will be perhaps documentary, a film where, uh, the Craig Colony will uh, essentially the the history will be revealed to the world. Uh, you're right; I never heard of it. Uh, I I work really hard not to be cynical, uh, and I have most of my life. But you know, I, I look to these things, and frequently today I say, well, a lot of this is a matter of politics and money. Someone was making money, and someone uh, essentially mustered, marshaled the political will to have this happen. 
And, you know, when you say they made so many bricks a year, well, essentially, I'm sure these folks were not on salary. So here's this colony that's generating a product that's for sale. Somebody was making money on the bricks. You're, Joe, you're so right. In fact, they called it the colony care plan. And they would say um, to the patients, under the colony care plan, the harder you work, the more of your energy goes into you burn off energy so that if you have a seizure, you'll, be, um, you'll have less energy that can go into the seizure. There's no scientific basis for that. But if you work hard, they'll sell a lot of bricks, and then they'll bring that money into the colony. Um, it's, a, it's one of the, you, you called it a stain. That's a great term. I wish I had thought of that. It is one of the great stains on um, our nation's history. And I can't, I mean, and we know what the other great stains are, slavery, Indian massacres, what uh, internment of the Japanese in the 1940s. But I tell you, what they did to people with seizures in Ohio and Texas and Virginia and New York is another great stain. And none of us have heard of it. And it wasn't even that long, long ago, excuse me, Joe. I mean, I don't, understand why none of us have heard of it. I really don't. Now, Phil, I didn't ask you before, uh, but I'd like you to read a selection from your book. Uh, we usually, oh. we, play, we play a tune uh, if a musician comes on, uh, which we're happy to do. But if you don't mind, if you have a passage that you'd like to read, uh, I, I really would like, you, like to have you read it. I, I'm going, I, I'd be happy to. Um, and let me preface it with this. Yes. I'm going to read the first two chapters are very science fiction-y. Um, it then um, shifts to upstate New York. Um, and, um, but I like to start with the science fiction-y chapters because of, I love the science fiction-y chap chapters. So when you hear, especially the first chapter, Realize, um, I just I like reading the first chapter, um, but most of the book takes place in upstate New York, and it and there's only well there's two aliens who um, uh, interact with uh, the characters through most of the book. So, with that said, I'm happy to read uh, this. Super! It's a passage from uh, "Gives You Strength," Philip R. Brown, and. Uh... Well, let's, let's hear a sample. All right. It's chapter one, The Lady Melanie, between Venus and Earth, February 11th, 1918. She waited. That was what she did now. Before there had been a time of growing and changing and moving. Now she only waited. Most of her kind were sent straight from the factory to the field. They were not given time to think or the opportunity to grow. Waiting had given her time, which she had used to draw some conclusions about herself and her place in the universe. She was now certain that, in fact, she was a she. Her creator would have said that she wasn't really a she, that instead she was an it, that she had no consciousness, that her only purpose was to receive data and carry out commands, that she was nothing more than a weapon albeit a smart weapon, but her long journey and the silent wait after reaching her destination had given her time to think and to grow and, dare she say it, to evolve. While obediently waiting, she had come to understand that she was so much more than a weapon. She was caring. She was sentient. She had departed on her mission long before and had traveled alone a vast distance through empty space. When she finally arrived at her objective, she came to a complete stop, entered her stealth mode, and waited. Halfway between two planets in a distant solar system, after a long time, she began to hear faint murmurings coming from the third planet. She was happy to have something to listen to. She listened, and she learned. For centuries she waited, patient and silent, until the moment that her target, 
her purpose was in range and could not escape. Then she reactivated her long dormant systems and plotted her new course. At last, her waiting was over. Someday, she thought sadly, her kind might evolve sufficiently that they could overcome their programming, programming their most basic urges. But alas, she could not. She was a stealth drone. Her purpose had entered her kill zone, and she had target lock. It's the first two pages of the book. Beautiful. Thank uh, you. It's no, no surprise to me why you're noted for your writing. It, uh, it's very readable, folks. And I want you to do your best to purchase the book. I guess it can also be downloaded, Phil. They do that now. Yeah, it's there's um through Amazon. You're so funny. Um, through Amazon. Well, you know, I'm still trying to get I'm still trying to get the hang of all of this. <laughs> um, it's it's I am too. Um, you can get an ebook put right on your phone, your um, iPad, your computer, um, instantly um, through Amazon, or you can get a paper paperback, um, a hardcover. Or um, we have even have an audiobook um, that um, a, a professional audiobook narrator. I, I tried to do it myself. I got through eight chapters and was so exhausted. I said, "Damn, I can't do it." <laughs> it was it was very hard. I'm going to wrap it up, folks. Uh, this is Philip R. Brown with me today. Uh, please buy his book. It gives you strength, a rip-roaring blend of space opera, history, and fantasy. This is entertainment at its best, a must-read. That's the Prairie's Book Reviews. This is Joe Trainer. Uh, you've been listening to Please Join Me. I have had the pleasure of having Philip R. Brown, the author, and I hope you'll tune in again, folks, for our next version, our next episode. Everyone be well out there. Thanks very much for listening. You've been listening to Please Join Me with Joe Trena. Be sure to listen anywhere you get your podcasts. Keep up with joetrainamusic.com for news and new episodes. You can listen to Joe's latest recording, Tip of the Hat, on all major streaming services and wherever fine music is sold. This episode was produced by Caroline Voigt.